sector solutions. So the agenda for today's webinar is the following. We're going to introduce the panelists, including the new director of SIF, Idara Nicholson. We'll give you a brief overview of SIF and the SIF registry platform and have a panel discussion about SIF and demonstrate the SIF registry platform. And then we'll leave time for discussion and Q&A uh, at the end. We have a great lineup of speakers and panelists uh, to talk about mobilizing private resources to grow promising, innovative, community-based solutions that have evidence of compelling impact. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through their bios in depth. They're available on the PowerPoint. But briefly, first we have as panelist Paul Carter, who is the director of the Social Innovation Fund at the Corporation for National and Community Service. And as many of you know, Paul will be departing from the corporation at the end of September after having successfully launched SIF over the last several years. At the end of the month, Paul is leaving SIF in the capable hands of Adara Nicholson, the corporation's chief investment officer. Since joining CNCS in 1998, she has served as the chief of program operations as well as the director of budget formulation and performance office. Adara also has extensive experience helping individuals and communities as director of the District of Columbia's Welfare to Work Employment Program and as a policy analyst at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. <laughs> After Idara, we will hear from Rhett Marbury. Rhett is the Vice President uh, with the Duke Endowment, where he's focused on health care and child care. The Duke Endowment has participated as a SIF funder. Uh, and unfortunately, Carol Thompson Cole had a conflict, so we're pleased to have Eleanor Rutland join the panel. Eleanor is the Chief Operating Officer of Venture Philanthropy Partners, Partners, a philanthropic investment organization that helps great leaders build strong, high-performing nonprofit institutions. And VPP is a SIF intermediary, and she will share experiences uh, with the program. Um, I've introduced myself. I'm the president and co-founder of the Growth Philanthropy Network, Alex Rosides. And GPN founded the Social Impact Exchange with a number of partners, uh, which created the SIF Foundation Registry. And I'm going to demo the registry uh, a little bit later. And I've just been told that uh, Stephanie Powers has joined us. I'm not sure if she's uh, able to uh, dial in right this moment. But Stephanie, if you're there, why yes, don't you take, uh, take the helm and lead us through the, uh, the webinar? All right, very good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Powers, and I'm the managing director of the Public Philanthropic Partnership Initiative at the Council on Foundations. And um, I apologize, it's not that I was late. It was that we've had technical problems, and I've been sitting here on mute trying to figure out how to get through. But I think we finally figured it out. So I want to thank you, Alex, for jumping in there. Um, so we're going to um, talk about the Social Innovation Fund uh, a little bit today. But more importantly, um, we really want to talk about this collaboration with the Social Impact Exchange on the development of the Social um, Innovation Fund Registry. And Alex, as he just said, will uh, take us through that in just a bit. So um, just to reiterate, the Social Innovation um, Fund, the goals for today really are to learn not so much about the Social Innovation Fund itself, um, but how you as funders out there might get involved if you have not been involved, and how this kind of new collaborative funding platform called the SIF Registry is uh, taking shape and how you can uh, get involved with that in helping to drive uh, uh, the social innovations uh, in partnership with the federal government. Um, so Paul did, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Alex did um, introduce uh, our panelists for today. And we're going to get started just to take a quick little poll um, about how familiar you all are with the Social Innovation Fund. As you will see um, on your screen, there's a set of uh, quick little uh, buttons there for you to click. So if you would click on your screen to select how familiar you are with the Social Innovation Fund. Um, Pretty self-evident if you're very familiar, be somewhat familiar, and see if you've heard about it but don't have a good understanding um, at all. 
or if you have not heard about it. So we'll just take a minute um, for you to vote on this. And I'm assuming Janice will see the, uh, there we go, we'll, we'll start to see the, um, the uh, questions. So let's talk a little bit about um, a Social Innovation Fund. As you, some of you may know, or many of you may know, it is a, a federal matching grant program. It's given out about $137 million over uh, the past three years. And uh, the variety of quite a, a large number of grantees have committed to raising an additional $350 million in matching funds, and all for the purpose of spreading these high-impact uh, programs and initiatives that have been reviewed very rigorously through uh, the Social Innovation Fund's process um, to really spread evidence-based practice. Um, you'll see on your screen there, there are five uh, elements, distinctive elements, to the program. Um, it is a competitive grant process. It does use intermediaries um, uh, as uh, in the selection process. Um, who then select a portfolio of sub-grantees. Um, it does require matching dollars, and there is a pretty rigorous evaluation that uh, um, SIP is using through the Corporation for National Community Service that administers the program to really drive performance and so that we can begin to build really a body of evidence of what really works in uh, scaling social solutions. And of course, um, very important knowledge sharing that there is an emphasis on, on generating and capturing uh, the knowledge that then can be shared more broadly, certainly, across the government and across uh, funders and nonprofits that are interested in improving uh, performance and finding things that do work. So um, as I said um, initially, while we want to talk a bit about the Social Innovation Fund itself, our real primary goal here today is to um, introduce the Social Innovation Fund to SIF Foundation Registry. So Alex, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And could you give us a brief overview of the Foundation Registry and what you hope to accomplish with this platform? Uh, this will help us ground uh, the rest of our discussion with our guest panelists. Sure. Uh, one of the main goals of the Social Impact Exchange is to facilitate funding of evidence-based nonprofits that are growing and scaling their impact. And to that end, we create initiatives that connect funders with exceptional nonprofits. And we created the SIF registry as a web-based funding platform designed to simplify the process for grant-making foundations to identify and consider providing matching funds for eligible SIF intermediaries and subgrantees. And it does so by aggregating information on SIF subgrantees on one secure site, which is made available to participating foundations. And funders can quickly search for the subgrantees that meet their foundation's grant making criteria, and they can filter by location, focus area, tags, and search terms. And we will demonstrate that uh, soon. And the goals of the SIF registry overall are to help every single subgrantee raise its required matching dollars and to build a community of funders who learn together and support growing evidence-based nonprofits. Stephanie, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so let's get started with our panel, uh, some of our other guests that have joined us. I um, wanted to kind of start with uh, the rationale from, from the government about the Social Innovation Fund. And early on in his administration, uh, President Obama uh, really issued, I think, um, kind of a a mandate to, to really start to look for creative results-oriented programs and, and really laid out kind of a marker that it is the government's responsibility and the government should be seeking out these kinds of programs and helping them to replicate their efforts across the country. 
So the president also um, believes that these are um, challenges, the solutions to America's challenges are really being developed every day at the grassroots level, and that the government should be supplanting those efforts, and, or I'm sorry, should be supporting those efforts. So Paul, can you talk a little bit more um, about what the president had in mind um, when we started this, this journey toward the social innovation uh, concept? Definitely, Stephanie. President Obama made this remarkable statement when he actually announced the Social Innovation Fund in 2009, and he was making two key points. First, he was acknowledging his belief that immense value for our society can be created by the process of growing solutions that work. Second, he was recognizing a limited but powerful and catalytic role for the government in the process of enabling uh, organizations to realize their full potential for impact. In essence, the Social Innovation Fund is a collaborative funding mechanism where private funders can co-invest to leverage matching dollars from the government. The SIF is intended to be an effective catalyst to raise the awareness of and to attract funds for nonprofits that have evidence of compelling impact. At the same time, it also aims to inspire a community of funders who will continue to support the growth of these high-performing nonprofits. The SIF registration uh, registry is a great example, we believe, of a way to facilitate this collaborative funding community. So Adara, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Sure. Thanks, Paul. So I'd like to just emphasize the administration's continued support and commitment to the SIF. Uh, CNCS also remains committed to this and wants to grow the SIF so that funders can feel confident in their investments. Um, and those investments that will benefit SIF nonprofits in the portfolio now and for years to come. Um, I'd also just like to build on Paul's statement about the funder community. So like any community, the SIF community can share tremendous specific issue-based knowledge, um, due diligence expertise, and on-the-ground experience with other funders. Um, the community offers a way for funders to get acquainted with a whole new group of sub-grantees and to build relationships that we hope will endure for years to come and to benefit a wide range of communities in need. Great. Thanks, Adara. Um, I'm going to turn to Eleanor now and ask Eleanor if she might describe Venture Philanthropy Partners' involvement with the Social Innovation Fund itself and why you believe that uh, SIF is a powerful initiative. Eleanor? Thank you, Stephanie. The Social Innovation Fund has enabled us to expand our portfolio of organizations while also helping them gain access to new funding streams. The SIF represents a true leveraged model bringing together public funds with private investors, foundations, and corporations to invest in proven programs to achieve strong results for our community. Our SIF initiative is Youth Connect, a network of six nonprofits, including College Summit National Capital Region, KIPP DC, the Latin American Youth Center, Metro Teen Aids, Urban Alliance, and Europe National Capital Region. These organizations have joined together with the shared purpose of improving the lives of youth ages 14 to 24 who are disconnected or at risk of becoming disconnected. Creating this network hasn't been easy. While each of these organizations has a proven track record for helping young people, their missions are very different. Several came to the table openly skeptical about the approach, but after nearly two years together, they are believers, and each is acknowledging that their individual impact could greatly be greatly magnified by the power of their collaboration. By integrating what each of these organizations do best through Youth Connect, we believe that we can dramatically accelerate the chances of success for the youth that they work with. At scale, our Youth Connect in initiative will serve the education and employment needs of an estimated 20,000 young people over five years, helping them successfully transition to productive, self-sufficient adulthood that includes completion of college, meaningful employment, civic participation, and productive, healthy, and safe lives for themselves and their children. It's an innovative model, and we know that there will be many challenges ahead, but we believe the potential for that impact is well worth this effort. For VPP, the SIF is playing an important role in helping us to gain access to and mobilize funding from a broader network of investors <clears throat> to complement the significant federal dollars available through the SIF. 
and also by developing a community of intermediaries and portfolio organizations that we can learn from, exchange ideas and best practices to share with the field. VPP's role as an intermediary is to ensure that funding from all sources is effectively invested through rigorous investment selection practices, <clears throat> due diligence, program monitoring, evaluation, and by providing strategic assistance to our portfolio organizations as they advance their work. We do all of this to maximize the potential of uh, UConnect for the SIF, funding partners, and for the, ultimately for the families of our community. Great. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so, Rhett, I want to turn to you now. Uh, tell us why the Duke Endowment decided to get involved with the Social Innovation Fund, and if you would, a little bit um, through the lens of why other funders should consider becoming funding partners of this initiative. Thanks, Stephanie. I'd be happy to. Uh, we at the endowment saw the fifth as a great opportunity to kind of raise the profile of an effective organization in our region. In this case, it was the Children's Home Society in North Carolina, which is one of the two states that we fund in. The Children's Home Society then is a fifth grantee through the Edna McConnell Clark uh, True North Fund. So Edna McConnell Clark was the intermediary. The Duke Endowment was has turned out to be a sub-funder in this case. And Children's Home Society had a promising model called family finding that helps to identify and locate family members of children in foster care. And some of the preliminary data around that suggests from a randomized control trial that the number of families located using family finding is about eight to ten times greater than the number of families located using traditional social work. So it's a promising model that Clark became interested in. We got involved with the program um, back in 2008, we helped to launch it um, in nine counties in North Carolina. So what the SIF funding has done is helped us to provide the necessary capital and importantly the strategic planning through BridgeSpan to try to expand this program statewide. So obviously leveraging the capital and the strategic planning expertise from BridgeSpan for one of our established grantees was a win for us. But but I want to emphasize that this was more than that. It was more than just taking something we were funding and capitalizing on some of these new resources. Uh, this SIP work has a lot more than just a financial upside. Our involvement with SIP has helped to strengthen our relationship with both the Children's Home Society and the Andrew McCall Clark Foundation. I think we work we are closer to both of them as a result of this work. And we're confident that, and this is important, we're confident that it will lead to additional collaborative work with these two organizations well into the future. Uh, I did want to make a comment in terms of things that funders ought to consider if they're interested in the SIF opportunity. We recommend strongly that you make sure there's good alignment between your goals at the foundation, at your foundation, and the goals of SIF. Uh, we think that's important to pay attention to. In other words, I, I would encourage you not to just uh, chase the money. But of course, and this is one of the great things about SIF, the SIF portfolio has great variety. There are a lot of options out there, a lot of different things being funded. So you should be able to find a match uh, that works for your organization and your priorities. And the SIF registry is a great way to get the information you need to make this determination because it allows you to kind of find grantees and intermediaries, like in our case, the Edna McCall Clark Foundation, that might share your funding interest and your geographic focus. So for all the funders on the phone today, um, I would just summarize by saying the SIF is, for us has been a great way to partner with another funder to try to advance a proven solution. That's great, and that's a great segue, um, that little um, support there, uh, advertisements for the SIF registry, uh, Rhett. Um, good segue to Alex in uh, doing a demonstration of what's, what's in that SIF registry. So Alex, why don't you uh, show us? Terrific. Um, so as, as, if we, as we've mentioned, the goal of the SIF registry is to make it easier for uh, SIF nonprofits uh, by providing easily accessible information on all of them on one secure platform. And you'll see that participating foundations can quickly find the nonprofits in the issues they fund and the geographies where they fund. So they can see what fits for them. 
and of course if you're a contributing funder you know you're getting the leverage of matching capital. Another key feature of the registry is that it gives foundations the ability to communicate with one another on the platform to facilitate collaborative funding. So here's how it works. We wanted to make it easy and engaging but also communicate substantial information. So the registry is open to all foundations. Uh, it does not cost anything to participate. Uh, at the end of the demo, we'll show you actually how to, to register and sign up. But the home page is quite simple, gives you some basic background information on how it works, how to get started, and which foundations are participating in it. Once you're registered, you go to the dashboard page each time. And the dashboard page gives you easy access, a quick way, shortcuts to the rest of the site. And the site has a section on subgrantees, intermediaries, and foundations, and a blogging section. You can quickly get to the issues that you care about, youth development, healthy futures, economic opportunity, or you can look at all of the subgrantees, but you can also get not only to the subgrantees, but to the intermediaries focused in those issue areas. Also on the dashboard page is an important section called recent notes. This is the area where foundations can post notes and communicate to the other foundations on the site about what they're interested in. And we'll show you in a minute where you can put those uh, notes and, and post them. But here is where folks can say that they're interested in a certain opportunity or ask a question of others. And by communicating and signaling their interest, it makes it easier for foundations to collaborate around the matching requirements so that they can get uh, all of the subgrantees to their full match. Also on the dashboard are two important lists. One list is a list of those subgrantees with recent foundation activity. What that means is these are all of the subgrantees, the nonprofits, where a foundation has either posted a note or changed their status. And changing one's status means that you are either in the process of reviewing uh, or approving that particular nonprofit for funding. And as you do change your status on a particular nonprofit, that will show up so that others can see that. So if you are off of the site for a week or so and you want to come back, you can quickly see this list of all the activity that has occurred while you were off the site. And then the last list on the dashboard, which we found to be very helpful for funders, is just a list of the subgrantees that your foundation is reviewing. Multiple program officers from each foundation can register for the registry. And so sometimes uh, it's helpful to know what other folks in, in your foundation are reviewing. So all of it will show up here. And this list also makes it so that you don't have to search for those subgrantees each time you come back. And you can resume your work with them uh, each time you come back without going through the whole site. So let's jump in. Uh, let's look at if you are interested in subgrantees in the economic opportunity area, you click on economic opportunity. You can also get there through the top navigation under subgrantees. And here is a quick set of information about all of the subgrantees in economic uh, opportunity. So you'll get the name, you'll get a quick description, you'll get the focus area, economic opportunity, which intermediary they're working with, what location they're located in, Providence, and the amount remaining on their match requirement. You can also print information about them, and I will show you how to do that in a moment. You're able to sort subgrantees by their issue area, youth development, healthy futures, economic opportunity, but also importantly, sub-issues. So there are a variety of sub-issues, of course, in economic opportunity or health or youth development. And foundations can zero in on those 
sub-issues where they fund and find the sub-grantees quickly that match with their very specific funding areas. You can also sort by population served uh, and by geography. So just quickly, if you wanted to go to the youth development uh, area, you click on the focus area for youth development, and uh, the list for youth development comes up. So let's just say that you're interested in College Summit of the National Capital Region. As soon as you click on that subgrantee, you come to the subgrantee page. And this is a page where you can find all the information practically that you could want about that nonprofit, hopefully in a user-friendly way so that you can dig in after looking at summary information to very detailed information. So on the right side, you'll see here that there is at-a-glance information about the organization, the name, the location, the CEO, the CIF contact, their website. You have in the middle the description of the organization, their CIF initiative, and the intended outcomes and impact, which we felt was very important to put right up front. On the left navigation, you get a sense of who their co-funders are, and you can click on the link to see who the rest of their co-funders are. And importantly, you have a pie chart that gives you what their full match requirement is and what is raised to date and what they still have remaining. Now below here, without leaving the page, you can learn more about their mission and goals, their program, their impact, Just cursory information here, just to give you a sense of whether this begins to fit and is interesting, their financials, their expenses, and their revenues, who their matching current funders are, I had a whole list of the people who actually currently fund them, and details about their SIF initiative. Now for more information, again, if in successive layers, there's a box here where you can click on their applications to SIF and their business plan, their Form 990s, the very detailed information that foundation program officers want to know once they're you know, very interested in that opportunity. So we wanted to be able to provide the substantive details on each organization. Uh, now, if you are interested in that organization and you want to update your status, or post a note, you click on one of these two buttons. And this is where it'll show up on the dashboard page. So you have a few different status options. Either you're, you're not reviewing it, which is the default, or it's in review and you're starting to review it. You're considering a match, which is it, it, you're further down the road in terms of funding it, or it's been approved. That will show up for other funders to see so that you're signaling what you're doing and they can potentially realize they might be able to collaborate with you. You can also post a note. So you just write into this box, and where that would show up is back on the dashboard. So that you're writing a note to other funders, we're seriously considering this one, um, and this is the amount of money we're considering to, to put into it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a process by which the organizations the foundations can actually communicate with one another about their intentions. And I just want to show you one other feature on uh, the registry. If one is interested in actually printing out the information, and often that's very helpful, there's the print function. And all of the information that was on that page about the nonprofit is right here in one report that can be printed out. All the narratives, all the, the tabs about mission and goals and program and impact, the basic information, including those documents which can be downloaded, their SIF application, their business plan. So we tried to make it user friendly to be able to also, for those who want to be able to print out and share and read, to be able to do so. The two other sections of the site intermediaries uh, play a hugely important role in, in the uh, social innovation fund, adding immense value. And we wanted to be able to highlight each and every one of them. So first you come to a list of all of the intermediaries. Their subgrantees are listed. 
you can minimize or expand on, uh, on that. And if you wanted more information about the intermediaries, you click to view their whole profile. And they each have a similar page to the nonprofit so that you can really learn about venture philanthropy partners and the value it's creating because the intermediaries, A, also need support in some cases. In other cases, it just gives funders an opportunity to figure out, as Rhett said, how to deepen the relationship with intermediaries and, and the value add that they provide. So again, you have at a glance information, uh, a description of their organization, their SIF initiative, and also the, the tab structure at the bottom of the page. So you don't have to leave the page. Again, you can just learn more about their mission and goals, their organization, their impact, their SIF initiative. And finally, last but not least, the foundations themselves. And we wanted to make sure that the other foundations on the site had a place to go where they could see who the other foundations are that are registered, their names, their organizations, and importantly, their emails. And uh, you know, a, a significant amount of the activity on the site will be connecting with other foundation program officers just via email so they can have discussions about uh, how to collaborate on, on funding. And these are foundations that have already uh, registered uh, for uh, the registry. There is a blogging section. Uh, it is not populated yet, but we will be sending out uh, starting next month, communications every uh, several weeks to uh, all those foundations that have registered, just updating them on uh, news about the registry and um, which nonprofits are in need of, of grant funding. Uh, I will just quickly show you how to register. I will log out to do that. So if I am not logged in and I want to create an account for everybody uh, who will hopefully do so, it's a very simple process. You just click on create an account. You put in your name, your email address, uh, first name, last name, and organization. And uh, you you will be, um, the information will be sent uh, to us. We'll just verify you are a foundation, and then you'll be good to go. So we think it's a wonderful platform to support the SIF's work to bring evidence-based nonprofits uh, to growth and scale, um, to reduce the information costs for funders, and give funders an opportunity to collaborate and communicate with one another. Uh, so um, let me stop there, uh, and uh, we'll get back to some discussions about it, and certainly have uh, time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Alex, very much. Um, it just looks like such a great tool information all in one place, all sort of a one-stop shop for um, social solutions and, a, and effective social, social solutions. Um, I wanted to turn to Paul. Oh, I should also say that um, we want to take questions from the audience, so please use your chat box uh, to, uh, to register your questions. We will get to those in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, but I wanted to turn back to Paul, and Paul, you've been, of course, steering this uh, in this helm for a couple of years. I'd like to get kind of just a general impression about the, the registry itself and how you think this is going to be helpful. One of the things that um, I thought you might want to point out too, uh, maybe talk to a little bit more, is that on this site you can see that there is the section for both the subgrantee and the intermediaries. And part of what makes the Social Innovation Fund I kind of innovative in terms of, of a government uh, government approach is the this use of, of intermediaries. So talk a little bit about, if you would, about how the fund is a little bit different in that sort of vein, and maybe how the registry could really be helpful to funders that might be interested in developing relationships with intermediaries. Okay, definitely, definitely. Let, let me go first back to the question you posed in, initially, which is a real quick answer on the value of this. I mean, we feel that the SIF registry will be an absolutely critical tool to enabling funders who have a desire to support high-impact organizations to actually get uh, easy access to ones that have been well, thoroughly qualified, uh, and also that, that clearly then uh, present, uh, just as you can see, exhaustive information 
uh, about what the nature of the opportunity is and the intervention that these specific nonprofits are supporting. So we think this is just an immensely important tool for the funder community. With respect to your question about what's different, I would want to first reference the five distinct elements that you alluded to uh, some minutes ago. Without a doubt, one of the most unique aspects of the SIF, we feel, is the decision to rely on experienced non-federal grant makers, which we refer to as intermediaries, to do this critical work of selecting, evaluating, and growing nonprofits rather than building new government bureaucracy. We believe that intermediaries are critical to our ability to succeed. We also believe that they can be a very valuable resource to uh, any funder that is considering supporting these subgrantees. Great. Um, so I think I'd like to hear from uh, Rhett. If we could circle back to you and maybe talk about how the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation has been providing added value to the, to the rollout of an effective program and how the SIF registry might have impacted the decision if it had been available at the time? Okay, great. Let me take the first one and explain a little bit of why we uh, decided to partner with Edna McConnell Clark. And it was primarily because we knew that the relationship would bring huge value to our work. Uh, the Clark model, which I think is noteworthy for its focus, really it's three-part. It identifies high-performing agencies. It couples those agencies with, with strategic planning, and then it uh, provides sufficient capital to try to move those uh, evidence-based programs and those effective programs to scale. And watching their model uh, through the SIF process and being exposed to their work uh, has taught us a lot about the importance of strategic planning, both internally within the foundation, but also among our grantees. And also the importance of adequately capitalizing your grantees so they're not spending all their time raising money, but instead are focused on their work, which in this case is serving children and families um, effectively. So that whole relationship with Clark and being able to watch how they do business has been extraordinarily informative and added value to our grant making. I'd also say that Clark's ability to aggregate capital, both from public sources as well as from philanthropic organizations, and to even bring in funding from individuals and corporations, I think is unmatched. So working with Clark under the SIF um, umbrella has certainly connected us to other funders that we would not have otherwise have met, um, which we obviously hope we can continue those relationships down the road and collaborate with those organizations and those funders as well. With respect to your second question around the SIP registry, uh, I would um, be comfortable saying that if the SIP registry had been operational at the time that we got involved with this work, uh, we would have had even greater assurances that our investment as a sub-funder and a sub-grantee would have been, uh, we'd had more assurances that we'd have had uh, multiple funders and multiple partners in this program. It would have been a way for us to just double check what we were hearing. And we all know it's difficult sometimes to sift through all the information on nonprofits uh, out there that are doing great work. and. What the SIF registry helps us to do is kind of simplify that by aggregate, uh, aggregating that information and uh, adding the valuable insights and comments that our colleagues in the field share on the SIF, on the registry website. So I think it's a great resource. Great, great, yeah, I think so too. I think it's going to benefit. Uh, it's going to benefit a lot of funders in developing these relationships with intermediaries. And um, I wanted, uh, Eleanor, I just wanted to go to you next uh, and get your thoughts about the registry itself and how do you think this will benefit uh, the sub-grantees uh, in addition to the funding community? Uh, we are really excited about the SIF registry as a great tool for, as folks have said, connecting funders and nonprofits uh, to inform them of this work and marshal additional resources for both the intermediaries and the subgrantees. You know, the registry has the potential to really shine a light on programs and innovations that are yielding significant results and to build a funding community that will bring additional resources to the nonprofits that are doing this great work on the ground every day. Our hope is that the registry uh, will help to grow this new community of funders who will provide the needed um, match funding 
for these organizations is we have a five-year vision uh, for our SIP initiative as well as our portfolio organizations. And you know, really what an asset for the SIP participants to have that regist registry working for them by providing consistent, concise information readily available. You know, that clearly takes a heavy lift off of them individually trying to do the outreach that they would need to do for each of, for the funding community individually. Great. Thanks very much. I, I took uh, Eleanor a little bit um, uh, out of turn, but it seemed like um, that um, comment about the uh, subgrantees is important to go alongside with the intermediary community. Um, and so Paul and Adara, I want to go back to you now and talk uh, to you, if you could, a little bit, if you would talk a little bit about what you see coming up um, in these, this next year um, for where the SIF might be heading, um, maybe some insights about what you've learned that will help inform how you uh, are going to proceed. And I know you'll be, Paul, you're going to be handling, uh, handing off um, the helm here to Adara. Uh, in the very near future, and so sort of would like to get both of your perspectives about um, how you see things proceeding, and then how maybe the registry might be a useful tool, for instance, in helping to maybe push some of the agenda um, on Capitol Hill or into the administration to kind of um, scale the idea of social innovation fund further across government agencies. So, Paul, why don't I start with you, and then uh, Adara can maybe jump in after that. Yeah, and I'll uh, keep it real brief here, Stephanie, because Adara, as the uh, director of the future, can speak most compellingly to where the fund is going. But I do want to highlight a couple of things that reflect the, the immense progress that we've made to date. And rather than boring you all with the kinds of things that we've actually done, you know, the work, the activities we've completed, which we think are immense, the bottom line is that we have now 20 intermediaries across the country who have selected through open evidence-based competitions 200 innovative, high-impact uh, uh, organizations that are serving needy people in communities in 34 states and the D.C. Uh, we have, as the federal government, we've granted $137 million out, uh, but as noted previously, all of these intermediaries and subgrantee partners have committed in aggregate an additional $350 million in matching funds, which they have yet to raise. Now, a good share of that has been raised, but, but an immense amount is yet to be raised, which is why the, the uh, opportunity is so critical for uh, other funders out there. Um, I also want to highlight that just in a year and a half of operation of these subgrantees, to date, they've already served 130,000 uh, incremental individuals in need through these programs. And that, that uh, number is only going to grow as they scale and we add more uh, subgrantees. So bottom line, we feel that the the Foundation Registry is an absolutely critical tool to enabling these organizations to get the resources they need to expand their, their absolutely critical work. And so with that, I'll uh, leave it to uh, Adara. So our major, looking into the future, our major priorities really uh, in some ways remain the same, but as the portfolio shifts a bit, um, some of these will gain heightened um, importance, and I'll touch on one thing, but generally, um, our goals for the future fall into three buckets. Um, we think about strengthening the core program, and that's all about operation and supporting uh, the intermediary grantees, supporting the subs as we can, positioning the SIF. Um, and the second bucket is around leveraging the core program, and so that's expanding the impact and the knowledge around it, um, increasing the engagement with other federal partners, and this is um, and with private partners, and this is certainly where the SIF um, registry comes in, because we want to um, partner with private funders to stimulate capital um, for the high-performing organizations that are currently in the portfolio, but also those who are, you know, right now thinking about applying or considering applying. Um, and I think as they see the success in the ability of current of current grantees to um, to aggregate capital around what's working, I think that's a great incentive for those who might be on the fence or who might be considering um, joining the SIF portfolio. Um, but just in terms of one of the things that we'll be doubling down on and part of what you would be investing in um, as part of the SIF registry is that, you know, one of the accomplishments that Paul and the team have really put in place in the SIF portfolio is that we have 71 rigorous evaluations 
currently underway right now. So that's 71 evaluations that in just a couple years will be out in the world and we'll be learning some fantastic things about what's happening across so many different program models and there'll be such rich, richness in that and that's what the support of, um, of intermediaries and the private funders, that's, what, that's a lot of what that work will culminate in. And so we're really excited about you know, that work getting out and how it um, creates ripple effects across the nonprofit sector, across the federal sector, across private philanthropy, and it really could be, um, could be uh, you know, ground changing, ground shifting. So we're really, I'm really excited about that. And so I think to the extent that, you know, the SIF registry can, can help build those relationships between funders and intermediaries and nonprofits, that it really just becomes a win-win for everyone. Um, I, I just would close by saying that the SIF registry is certainly a tool that can be used to demonstrate um, to those who appropriate federal funds um, to the SIF that the program has merit. Um, we'll certainly be um, looking to strengthen and deepen our, um, our contact with the Hill to make sure that as all of this great information and great work is happening that we let them know um, what's going on. And we think the SIF registry should accelerate um, the leveraging of public and private dollars. So it really offers a way to foster those partnerships and, um, and track, our, track our progress. Terrific. Thank you. Um, this is the time for the audience to be uh, typing in your questions, if you would. Um, please send those, because we'd like to turn, uh, turn to the audience. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to um, bring Nicole Kindred back and uh, talk a little bit about um, the registry. And uh, she had uh, wanted to pose some questions to the audience about that. Nicole? Yes, actually, the first question is for Alex. There have been a few questions about who is eligible to sign on as a user. Uh, can you be a, a corporate grant maker, a corporate um, grant maker, or do you have to be a foundation? And um, just explain that a little bit. Sure. Um, yes. Well, any foundation is eligible to sign on, but also corporate grant makers, uh, if they are a corporate foundation or if they are a corporate grant maker, um, and they are certainly eligible. Uh, any any kind of institutional grant maker. Great. The next the next question is uh, for Paul. Are there spe specific taxonomies for impact required by SIF, or can each grantee use its own? Um, it is the latter. Um, we, we operate by proposal. So the, the SIF, as um, Stephanie noted, one of these other five distinctive characteristics is that we are an open, uh, competitive selection process in which intermediaries uh, put forth proposals for the type of impact uh, that they intend to create. So what problem they're going to address, what is their theory of change, what kinds of grants will they make to whom, why those grants are going to add up to the kind of impact that they're intending to create, how the intermediary will, will uh, manage those grants, and how they'll track progress. So first of all, we, we absolutely rely on the intermediaries to define the uh, critical outcomes that they're going to commit to achieving. Now that said, we have looked at aggregating them, trying to find commonalities and that sort of so, so we are trying to realize appropriate synergies that both enhance our ability to help these programs be successful, but also help um, create a platform that we feel may, may have value to the broader field. But it, it absolutely begins with the, uh, the um, uh, outcomes uh, that are defined by the grantees themselves. I think we have time for one more question, and this has to do with the financial sustainability plans. What's required of the subgrantees when their SIF dollars expire? I guess Paul or Idara? Well, I, I guess I'll take a first shot at that, which is that um, we don't have at this point a specific uh, re requirements that the applicants lay out their path after the 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 end of SIF funds, but we do invite them in the proposal process to describe uh, their thoughts and uh, don't lay out any plans that they may have. This is absolutely a, an important issue uh, for us, which as a combined program now, we are really beginning to 
dig into given that we have subgrantees that are completing uh, or you know, I guess beginning to approach the end of their second year. So it's not it's not an immediate uh, you know critical issue that demands attention, but it's one that's very much on our minds. In general, what we are looking at is or, is that we're we're thinking of the SIF funds as three to five years of funding that enable these organizations to build capacities that they would not otherwise have. Uh, but there is absolutely no expectation, at least that we're creating, that they will continue to receive SIF funding. So, so you should look at the SIF funding as, as truly opportunistic in the sense that it, it gives you the chance to work with your grantees or organizations that you care about, put your money to work, in, in enabling organizations to get where they would not be able to get otherwise. It also buys them some time to explore important ongoing strategic questions like what is the nature of the financial uh, model that would be most suitable to the ongoing success of these organizations and, and help them develop that and uh, explore that. Um, that's right on. The only thing that I would add is that you know the evaluation work that's currently happening uh, will be key to helping to inform what the roadmap for the next, you know, three, five, ten years will look like for many of these, um, for many of the grantees and their subs. And so at this point, as Paul said, it's something that, you know, we are beginning to talk o about a bit more as um, the, the model, as the portfolio matures, particularly the first round of grantees. Um, but that, those decisions can't be made um, in, in isolation of what's happening on the evaluation side. And so that is certainly the work that we'll be um, that we'll be focusing on on the next on the next couple years. But as Paul indicates, um, there are so many the other factors that play into that are certainly the funding model, um, also just the type of work that they're um, that they're involved in. Because you know, as things get more attention, such as healthcare or other issues rise to the top, there might be a broader audience for what they're working on that just isn't present right now, um, and so. Time will sort of tell, but certainly it'll be determined by key factors. Thank you very much. Um, so I think our, we're coming to our end of our time, and I'd like to wrap up today. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists, um, and also take a little bit of license uh, and suggest that both uh, Eleanor and Rhett, I'm sure, would be more than willing offline to take phone calls from colleague funders. Um, about their experiences uh, as an intermediary and a subgrantee in the Social Innovation Fund. I'd like to thank Paul and Adara for their time um, and all of their work on making the Social Innovation Fund a success. And as funders out there on the call, I just wanted to add this. Um, please do share that this uh, registry is up and running now. Please share this with your funder networks, with the affinity groups that you belong to. Um, because we think they would be um, important uh, uh, distributors, basically, of this information to other funders who are looking for strong evidence-based practice. Um, and Alex, do you want to just reiterate, this is ready to go, correct? Absolutely, and uh, we would welcome everybody's participation as a, a foundation institutional funder. I think that uh, there will be great amounts learned by all through the participation. As everybody knows, is the, the registry uh, is really a, a resource to share information. There's no expectation uh, that you have to fund, but just by participating, I think we all benefit. So uh, the the URL is www.sifregistry.org. Uh, very simple to to uh, to register. And if you have questions or you have affinity groups that you think would be interested in uh, sharing this with their members, you can contact uh, us uh, and Janice Schuess. Um, her uh, email is right up on the screen there, and we'd be delighted to, to talk with you. Terrific. Thank you very much. And so the instructions are on the screen. The slides will be sent to uh, participants. They will be available. And um, we also uh, understand that Alex and his team will send you all the registration instructions and a short survey, I think, that they'd like to get some feedback from you. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. And we hope that uh, we will continue uh, good discussions about scaling up strong evidence-based social innovation in partnership between philanthropy and the government. So thank you all very much, and good afternoon.
Thank you.